In 1908, Charles Lewitt found his wife Caroline shot dead at a neighbor's country house. On the morning of August 24, 1908, Caroline Mary Lewitt said goodbye to her husband as he left for a hunting trip. When Major General Charles Lewitt returned home, he found his wife shot and killed. Their home was an isolated summer house in a heavily wooded area of England. Authorities were never able to hammer down who the killer was, but it was rumored that John Dickman, who was later hung for murdering a passenger on a train in 1910, could have been involved in her death. Caroline's desolate husband later committed suicide. Caroline and Major General Charles Lewitt were upstanding members of their community in Kent, England. Then, tragedy struck, robbing them of the life they had built and enjoyed together. First, Caroline was found murdered at a neighbor's country home in Sealchart, Kent. Just weeks later, Charles took his own life. And though there's been much speculation, the case, widely known as the Sealchart murder, was never conclusively solved. Charles Lewitt was a former military man, a golfer, and a local politician who had founded the Patriotic Party. Caroline Lewitt was a well-liked friend, neighbor, and frequent volunteer for charitable causes. The parents of two grown sons, the couple was settling into the golden years of their life. Their social standing, as upper-class members of late Victorian society, made their untimely deaths particularly shocking and notable. The series of events began on August 24, 1908, a typical summer's day for 58-year-old Caroline and 69-year-old Charles. They left their home together, on foot, at 2.30 p.m. Charles was headed to the golf club to retrieve his clubs, while Caroline was planning to enjoy some exercise before returning to the house for afternoon tea with a friend. At 3 p.m., they parted ways at a particular gate. She headed through the gate and down a path that would take her through the woods, past their neighbor's mostly unused summer house, and back to their home. Charles traveled onward to the golf club. Charles Lewitt's Golf Club Photo, Topical Press Agency slash Getty Images Little did the couple know it would be the last time they ever bid each other farewell. Various townspeople saw the Major General over the next 35 minutes as he made his way to the club. At around 4.05 p.m., after leaving the club, the local vicar, driving in the opposite direction, promised him a ride home after completing an errand. The Reverend made good on this word, driving by again and picking Charles up at 4.20 p.m. and depositing him at his home at 4.25 p.m. Arriving at home, Charles was surprised to find Mrs. Stewart, the friend Caroline had promised to host for tea, waiting patiently for his wife's return. Upon realizing Caroline was missing, Charles set off in search of her at 4.30 p.m. 45 minutes later, his search ended when he found her lifeless body on the veranda of their neighbor's summer house. She had been shot in the back of the head, twice, and her purse and rings were missing. No cartridges could be found, in fact, there was no evidence of the killer at all, save for a few footprints. In the aftermath of Caroline's murder, many strangers and self-proclaimed experts determined that Charles had killed his wife, despite his tight alibi. He could account for his whereabouts at 3.15 p.m., the estimated time of the murder based on the accounts of a neighbor and a gardener, both of whom heard three shots fired in the general direction of the summer house. Furthermore, the Major General offered up all three of the revolvers he owned to the authorities, and none matched the bullet holes found in Caroline's skull. Still, rumors proclaiming Charles's guilt spread. Some believe that Caroline's missing rings had in fact been taken by Charles to throw police off of his trail. Soon, Charles was receiving hate mail from people vehemently accusing him of his wife's murder. The summer house where Caroline was found murdered. Photo, Topical Press Agency slash Getty Images As the days progressed with no new evidence leading to any likely suspect, Charles's hope of finding Caroline's killer dwindled. Devastated, and a pariah in his community, he put his home up for sale. A member of Parliament, Colonel Ward, offered Charles a place to stay. On September 17, as soon as the official inquest had ended, Colonel Ward collected the Major General and took him home. Additionally, the Lewis son, stationed in South Africa, had finally gotten news of the family tragedy. He was en route to England to be with his father the following day. 
On the morning of September 18, the day his son was due to arrive, Charles Lewitt woke up, showered, and walked to the local train station. There, he hid in the bushes beside the track, then committed suicide by jumping in front of a passing train. The general major met his tragic end less than a month after his wife met hers. Lewitt's suicide fanned the flames of the seal chart murder mystery. In the ensuing years, investigators came to believe the crime was committed by someone Caroline knew, rather than by a random passerby. They thought her rings had been taken in an attempt to mislead the authorities to the true motive of the murder. In 1914, Sir Sidney Orme Rowan Hamilton, who went on to serve as Chief Justice of Bermuda in the 1930s, wrote a book about the unsolved murder that explored this line of thinking. He put forth the notion that Caroline's killer was a man named John Dickman. Dickman was sentenced to death in 1910 for murdering a man on a train. Roman Hamilton asserted that Dickman was connected to Caroline Lewitt through an advertisement the former placed in the Times. He believed that Caroline responded to John Dickman's advertisement, asking for financial help, by sending him a check, which Dickman then forged, possibly by changing the amount. Upon discovering the forgery, Caroline contacted the man and arranged to meet with him, without telling her husband. So the theory goes, Dickman then murdered Caroline at this meeting to cover his tracks. This is just a theory, however, and has never been conclusively proven. To this day, the seal chart murder case remains unsolved. Taylor was a popular director whose fame grew immensely in the Hollywood scene of the 1910s and early 1920s. Between 1914 and 1922, he directed 59 silent films, and acted in 27 between 1913 and 1915. This is why his murder on February 1, 1922 led to a frenzy of fabricated newspaper reports. The initial doctor on the scene called his death one of natural causes, a stomach hemorrhage. This doctor was never seen again, perhaps due to his embarrassment when forensic investigators examined the body and found a bullet hole in Taylor's back. All his valuables were in place, implying the motive for the murder was something other than theft. More than a dozen individuals were named as suspects, but none officially convicted. Nearly thirty years later, Margaret Gibson, an actress of Taylor's time, came forward and confessed to the crime with a flimsy story that didn't convince prosecutors. She wasn't charged. William Desmond Taylor was Hollywood's most prolific Irish director at the time, working behind the camera on some 60 movies and as an actor in 27 more. He worked with some of the greatest actors and actresses of the silent era, including Mary Pickford, Wallace Reed, Dustin Farnham and others. But it was the fame of his shocking, unsolved murder that would ultimately overshadow Taylor's cinematic career. Born William Cunningham Dean Tanner in 1872, the man who would become William Desmond Taylor left Ireland for the United States in 1890, where he worked at a dude ranch in Kansas before moving to New York where he married Ethel May Hamilton in 1901. They were married for almost seven years before William abruptly disappeared, deserting his wife and young daughter. After his disappearance, it was revealed that he had suffered from mental lapses, and some friends thought that he might have wandered away while suffering from amnesia. William traveled through Canada and the northwestern United States until, in 1912, he found himself in Hollywood. He had changed his name to William Desmond Taylor, and he quickly found work as an actor before directing his first film, The Awakening, in 1914. In the decade that elapsed between Taylor's arrival in Hollywood and his murder, he directed dozens of films and also served in the Canadian Expeditionary Force near the end of World War I. On the morning of February 2, 1922, Taylor's body was found in his bungalow in Westlake, Los Angeles by his valet Henry Peavy. A crowd quickly gathered, and someone who identified himself as a doctor stepped forward and declared that Taylor had died of a stomach hemorrhage. When the police examined the body, however, they found that Taylor had been shot in the back with a small caliber pistol. The doctor vanished and was never seen again. It was only the first of several strange clues and unexplained disappearances that would plague the case. Taylor's wallet held $78 in cash, and he wore a two-carat diamond ring, which would seem to discount the idea that the murder was a robbery gone bad. And yet the day before, 
Taylor had shown his accountant a large sum of money which was nowhere to be found. The ensuing investigation became as much a matter for the papers as for the police, with many sensational and often inaccurate or downright fabricated newspaper reports coming out surrounding the murder. Robert Giroux, a renowned book editor, publisher, and author of the 1990 book about the murder A Deed of Death, has been quoted as saying that, the studios seemed to be fearful that if certain aspects of the case were exposed, it would exacerbate their problems. A police detective who worked on the case claimed, many years later, that within the first week of the investigation they got the word to lay off. Perhaps due to these desires to ash up certain aspects of the crime, much of the physical evidence relating to the murder was lost either right away or over the intervening years. In spite of these setbacks, the police and press identified more than a dozen possible suspects in the killing. There was even one confession, though no one was ever charged and the case remains officially unsolved to this day. While most of the suspects were ultimately cleared by the police, many of them present their own strange stories that could have come straight out of a film noir. Edward Sands had worked as Taylor's valet until about seven months prior to the murder, during which time he had forged Taylor's name on checks. Sands had even burgled Taylor's bungalow, leaving his footprints on the bed. For some, Sand is considered the most likely suspect, while for others he's another victim of a larger conspiracy. In the wake of the murder, he was never seen or heard from again. Henry Peavy took over as Taylor's valet after Sands and found the director's body. While the police cleared him after intense questioning, the story goes that a reporter for the New York Daily News was convinced that Peavy was the killer and thought she could trap him into a confession. Believing that he would be afraid of ghosts due to his race, she offered to pay him $10 if he could identify Taylor's grave in Hollywood Park Cemetery. An accomplice had already gone ahead and was waiting at the grave site draped in a white sheet. When Peavy approached, the sheeted accomplice claimed to be the ghost of Taylor and said, You murdered me. Confess, Peavy. Unfortunately for them, Peavy saw right through their charade, thanks in no small part to the fact that they hadn't known that Taylor had a strong British accent while the ghost was from Chicago. Mabel Normand, a popular comedic actress, was said to have been a lover of Taylor's, and is one of the last people to have seen him alive. While most have ruled her out as a suspect, she was, at the time, addicted to cocaine, and, in an effort to help her kick her dependency, Taylor had recently met with federal prosecutors to assist them in charging her suppliers. Some have since theorized that Norman's suppliers may have hired a contract killer to take care of Taylor. Mary Miles Minter was a former child star and protege of Taylor who was allegedly deeply in love with him. Passionate letters from Minter to Taylor were found in his bungalow, and many sources alleged a sexual relationship between the two that had begun when Minter was only 17 and Taylor was 47. According to Minter's own statements, however, Taylor refused to reciprocate Minter's advances and said that he was too old for her. Charlotte Shelby, Minter's mother, who many contemporary sources characterized as manipulative and greedy, is a favorite suspect among many amateur detectives and true crime writers in the years since the murder. Circumstantial evidence connecting her to the killing is exacerbated by the fact that she owned a rare gun similar to the one that killed Taylor, and after his murder she threw it in the Louisiana bayou. Margaret Gibson, an actress who worked with Taylor when he first came to Hollywood, died of a heart attack in 1964. Having recently converted to Catholicism, she gave a deathbed confession in which she is said to have confessed to having shot and killed William Desmond Taylor. This didn't become public until 1999, when it was printed in the newsletter Taylorology, devoted to collecting and transcribing newspaper articles and other accounts relating to the murder. In spite of these and other suspects, the murder of William Desmond Taylor remains a tale with more mysteries than solutions, and has left behind a legacy that influenced films like Sunset Boulevard and Hollywood Story, as well as dozens of true crime writers and core vitals novel Hollywood. We may never know what really happened to William Desmond Taylor, and perhaps that's where much of our continued fascination with his death lies. The Hinterkaifeck Murders, Many Mysteries, Few Answers There were signs something terrible was going to happen to farmer Andreas Gruber and his family. Then it did. Just north of Munich lay the Hinterkaifeck Farm, located between Ingolstadt and Schrobenhusen. 
The inhabitants were the farmer Andreas Gruber, 63, his wife Casilia, 72, their widowed daughter Victoria Gabriel, 35, Victoria's children, Casilia, 7, and Joseph, 2, and the maid, Maria Baumgartner, 44. On March 31, 1922, all six were found dead. They had been murdered with a mattock, a hand tool similar to a pickaxe. A few days before the murder, Andreas spoke to neighbors about footprints in the snow leading into the farm, but none leading back. He also claimed to have heard footsteps in the attic, found an unfamiliar newspaper on the farm and house keys when missing several days before the murders. None of this was reported to the police until long after the murders had been committed, preventing the solving of the brutal murders. There were warning signs in the days before the murders. Farmer Andreas Gruber told neighbors he had found strange footprints in the snow leading from the woods toward his house, but no footsteps leading away. He heard footsteps in the attic. He found an unfamiliar newspaper. The house keys went missing. After the murders, after all six residents of the farm were dead, smoke continued to come from the chimney. Someone apparently continued to feed the cattle and to eat the food in the kitchen. The slaughter happened long ago, in the winter of 1922, at a small farm in Bavaria, Germany called Hinterkaifeck. But today, decades later, investigators continue to be haunted by this tantalizing cold case. The bodies were discovered four days after the murders, when seven-year-old Casilia failed to show up at school. Mysteriously, it appears the first four victims had been lured separately into the barn and brutally murdered, one by one. The murder weapon was a pickaxe. After killing Andreas, 63, his wife Casilia, 72, their widowed daughter Victoria, 35, and her seven-year-old daughter Casilia in the barn, the killer, or killers, headed to the house and murdered two-year-old Joseph and the maid Maria Baumgartner, 44. With few clues and no witnesses, Police took the strange step of removing the heads of the victims and sending them to a clairvoyant in Munich, but with no results. More than 100 suspects were questioned over the years and decades, as late as 1986, but no arrests were ever made. In 2007, investigators re-examined the scene with modern equipment, but, again, turned up nothing. There is a memorial to the six victims in the graveyard where they are buried, still without their heads. The skulls which were sent to Munich were lost in the chaos of World War II. On a quiet summer night in Iowa, eight people were bludgeoned to death while they slept in their beds. Even today, police know very little about these eight gruesome deaths, despite the movie an immense amount of gossip that their murders inspired. During the evening of June 9, 1912 in Villisca, Iowa, Six members of the Moore family and two house guests were found murdered in the Moore home. All eight victims, including six children, had suffered from severe head wounds from an axe. The axe had belonged to the family and was left in the guest bedroom after the deed was done. The investigation for this case got further than most on this list. Several suspects were processed and many went to trial, one even went twice. The first trial ended in a split jury while the second netted the suspect an acquittal. The Moors were well-known and well-liked in their community. The motive and the case remain a mystery. Miss Mary Packham had a terrible feeling about her next-door neighbors. It was a sunny summer morning in 1912, and yet the Moore family household was eerily still. Every curtain was drawn and all the doors were locked, strange for a friendly town like Villisca, Iowa. After numerous knocks went unanswered, Miss Peckham finally called a Moore relative for help. Ross Moore arrived soon after, with a spare key in hand. Together, they opened the door to one of the grisliest murder scenes in American history. Every member of the Moore family, Josiah and his wife, Sarah, their four children, Herman, Mary, Arthur, and Paul, had been bludgeoned to death with an axe. Two of Mary's friends, Ina and Lena Stillinger, who happened to have slept over that night, were also found dead. All eight victims were discovered in their beds. Only Lena showed signs of being awake during the attack. Somehow, the killer had slipped in at night and crept through the halls, systematically slaughtering the Moore family and their guests with axe swings so violent he left gouge marks in the ceiling. 
The Chrisley Velisca Axe murders of June 10, 1912 shocked the surrounding community, both for its random brutality and the string of bizarre clues left behind at the scene of the crime. A heavy slab of bacon was discovered in the downstairs guest room, beside a broken keychain and the gory murder weapon. A bowl of bloody water sat beside a plate of uneaten food on the table in the kitchen. Creepier still? After his killing was done, the murderer draped cloths over the crushed faces of his victims. He then maneuvered through the home and ceremoniously covered each mirror and exposed window pane with linens pulled from dresser drawers. Who could have committed such a heinous act? Theories abounded, yet there was never enough evidence to convict anyone of the crime. Some accused Frank F. Jones, an Iowa state senator and business rival of Josiah Moore's, of hiring a contract killer to execute the Moore family. Others pointed to a violent man named Henry Lee Moore, no relation, who had bludgeoned his mother and grandmother with an axe in the months after Velisca and was suspected of additional slayings. Others still pointed to Reverend George Kelly, a traveling minister who actually confessed to the crime in 1917. Kelly was in Velisca at the time of the killings and even posed as an inspector from Scotland Yard to get a closer glimpse of the murder scene. He was also a rumored sexual deviant who struggled with mental health issues his whole life. Soon after signing his confession, the Reverend recanted. He was tried twice for the killings and eventually cleared of all charges. To this day, the Velisca Axe murder case remains open, enticing amateur sleuths around the globe. The grisly tale also attracts tourists with a taste for macabre. The Moore Homestead in Velisca is now a museum. For around $500 per night, you can even rent a house for a spooky sleepover. Her screams went unanswered, and her murder remains a mystery. Georgette Bauerdorf was the daughter of an oil tycoon and lived a life of privilege. Her future looked bright. But darkness descended on the night October 11, 1944. By the following morning, the young woman was dead, the victim of a murder. To this day, Georgette's case remains unsolved. Her smile shines from an old photograph, offering a glimpse into the beautiful world of a young woman on the cusp of adulthood. But darkness lurks at the edge of the portrait. Georgette Bauerdorf was a young socialite with a grand future until 1944, when her life was cut short in the dead of the night. The most unsettling part of the story? Georgette's murder remains unsolved over 70 years later. Born to an oil tycoon in New York City in 1924, Georgette lived a life of privilege. She and her older sister attended a convent school on Long Island, where they were trained in goodness and propriety. When the girl's mother died in 1935, the Bauerdorf siblings and their father moved to California, where Georgette was once again enrolled in a school that befit her place in society. Alumni of the Westlake School for Girls in Los Angeles included Shirley Temple and Myrna Loy. Upon graduation in 1941, young Georgette moved to West Hollywood to pursue an acting career. By the age of 20, she found work at the Los Angeles Times in the Women's Service Bureau and at the Hollywood Canteen, a dining and dancing club that catered to young men in uniform. Georgette called El Palacio her home, a grand Spanish-style house that played host to numerous celebrities. Her evenings were filled with nights out on the town, she was courted often and enjoyed the attention of her many suitors. Exactly what happened on the night of October 11, 1944 remains a mystery. It was a Wednesday, Georgette was at the canteen, where her role as a junior hostess meant she danced with and entertained the servicemen on layover in Los Angeles. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary that night. At the end of her shift, she climbed into her sister's Pontiac coupe and drove home. At 11 a.m. the following morning, Georgette's maid and a janitor arrived to clean her apartment. They were met with an unlocked front door. The cleaners entered and found Georgette's lifeless body face down in her bathtub, the water still running. She was wearing the top part of a pajama set. Her hair floated in the water. When police surveyed the scene, they found little evidence of a struggle, though the coroner later confirmed the bruises on Georgette's body suggested she put up a fight before her death. A partially unscrewed light bulb outside her front door led investigators to believe that her killer had hidden in the darkness, perhaps even entering the apartment before Georgette arrived, lying in wait to make a move. 
Police assembled a rough timeline of Georgette's final moments. They believe she came home late, ate a snack in her kitchen, and was then killed by someone who may or may not have been a stranger. A downstairs neighbor heard screaming at about 2.30 a.m., along with shouts of stop. You're killing me. The neighbor assumed it was a domestic dispute and returned to sleep. The janitor himself claimed he heard the sounds of high-heeled footsteps from Georgette's apartment and then a crash as if something had been dropped yet he couldn't confirm that there had been a second person in her apartment. Whatever occurred, Georgette's last moments were certainly a desperate attempt to save her own life. In the days following the murder, police received a letter from a Sergeant Gordon Oddland. Oddland claimed the woman matching Georgette's description gave him a lift through Hollywood on the night of October 11th. In the letter, he described the woman as appearing quite nervous, though he would downplay this claim in later years. The killer, meanwhile, vanished into the night after the slaying, driving off in Georgette's car. The vehicle was found some distance away, abandoned and out of gas. It was the last trace of the killer in a case that quickly went cold. Georgette Bauerdorf's body was shipped back to New York, where it was interred in a family-owned plot in a Long Island cemetery. While much has been written about the killing, little is concretely known. Some speculators associate Georgette's death with that of Elizabeth Short, a.k.a. the Black Dahlia, claiming that the same man murdered the two Hollywood hopefuls. Implicated in this theory is a tall individual with a limp named Jack Anderson Wilson, who plays a part, although peripherally, in both stories. The murder remains a mystery to this day. Seventy years from that fateful night, there's little chance that Georgette's death will ever be solved. The victim of a brutal murder mystery lives on in graffiti messages scrawled across Europe. Who put Bala in the witch elm? On April 18, 1943, four local boys went poaching in Hagley Wood when they came across the large witch elm. One climbed to the top, looked into the hollow trunk and discovered a skull. He quickly realized he had discovered a human skull. Because they were on the land illegally, the boys decided not to report it. Out of guilt, the youngest of the boys eventually caved and told his parents what they found. When the police checked the tree, they discovered an almost complete skeleton with a shoe, cold wedding ring and fragmented clothing. The remains of a hand were found a distance from the tree. The remains were deemed to have been of a 35-year-old woman, dead for 18 months, placing the time of death in October 1941. The forensic examiner found taffeta in her mouth which suggested she died of suffocation. Because the country was in the midst of World War II, identifying the body proved difficult. Somewhere along the way, the autopsy report and the remains of Bella disappeared, adding yet another dimension of mystery to the case. Her skull peered out from the hollow trunk of a tree, a limp patch of hair still stuck to its crown. But on a bright spring morning in 1943, for boys from Starbridge, England, traipsing through Hagley Woods near Witchbury Hill, had no idea what they would find. They were on the hunt for birds' nests when they spotted the old witch elm, and it was just begging to be climbed. Little Bob Farmer agreed to go first, he scrambled up. When he peered into the tree's hollow trunk, he nearly fell backward. Staring back were the empty eye sockets of a human skull. The boys raced home to their parents. Police were dispatched to Hagley Wood, where they discovered a crime scene straight out of True Detective. Stuffed inside the tree was the decomposed body of a young woman, nearly complete. Crepe shoes clung to the skeleton's feet, a gold wedding ring hung from her left hand. The woman's right hand, meanwhile, had been completely sawed off. Police found it buried at the base of the tree in a ritual fashion. Forensics placed the victim's age at 35, she was the mother of one and had been dead for 18 months. Doctors concluded that she had been strangled and stuffed in the witch elm while still warm, as her body could not have fit once rigor mortis set in. Who was she? How did she meet such a grisly end? News spread quickly about the tree murder riddle. Many cried witchcraft. Others believed it to be the slain body of a prostitute. Then, the graffiti appeared. Who put Lubella down the witch elm? Read the hastily painted message on a wall in nearby Old Hill around Christmas time that year. Another popped up in Birmingham, Hagleywood Bella. 
At the base of the crumbling obelisk atop Witchbury Hill, the ultimate version appeared, who put Bella in the witch elm. Numerous attempts to locate the author behind the graffiti were unsuccessful. The probing slogan spread throughout England and Europe, where it took on a life of its own. To this day, the question still appears scrawled across the walls of back alleyways, reigniting interest in the case. The actual murder, meanwhile, may never be solved. Since the gruesome discovery coincided with wartime, resources were strained and police were overwhelmed with missing persons reports. Many of the case files have long since been lost. Even the body slipped through the cracks, authorities do not know where it ended up. All that remains is the mysterious graffiti asking its haunting question, who put Bella in the witch elm?